Right, Mr. Gosar. Mr. Pimley and Mr. Gabriel, Reclamation has an ownership interest in the Navajo Generating Station, and Western receives a significant amount of power from the station's energy production. Furthermore, a recent Arizona State University study found that 3,400 jobs are connected to the station's operation. Do either of you know or have a ballpark of how much revenue to the taxpayers is being lost due to delays caused by the EPA regulations? Mr. Gabriel, first. No, I do not. You'll get back to me with that? I will get back Thank to you, Mr. Pimley. I'm sorry, delays by the EPA? Yep. I'm not sure I understand that. Oh, I know that we, we're working, uh, we have worked with other Department of Interior and local stakeholders to uh, evaluate the, the better than BART. Uh, well, control. like you and I talked about in my office right. earlier, you know, um, regional haze is, is, is a state primacy issue, not a federal oversight. And so all these delays are actually causing cost prohibitive uh, problems to the taxpayer. So I'd like to have what these delays are actually causing uh, the taxpayers and lost revenues. Okay. Can I, get I, back I, can, to me? I can get back to you. Sir. Okay. Mr. Pimley, Reclamation's 24.3 percent participating interest in the Navajo gener Generating Station is used to provide power for the Central Arizona Project. And as you know, CAP is the federal water project that delivers Colorado River to agricultural water users in Central Arizona and many of the state's large municipal water users, including the cities of Phoenix and Tucson. In fact, Phoenix, 50 percent, and Tucson, 80 percent of their water comes through CAP. Excessive and overreaching regulations by the EPA threaten to close NGS. Do you believe that we need to restore some common sense to this dialogue, and can you touch on the importance of keeping NGS open? Well, NGS is a critical component for the Central Arizona project, as you as you well know, sir. Uh, it was <clears throat> we we have about a quarter of the capacity that the CAP water users pay power rate for. We reserve about a quarter of that entire unit or uh, generating station's capacity. Um, as I mentioned. Uh, we looked at the EPA's uh, um, best alternative retrofit technology recommendation, and and they uh, opened up the uh, um, gave us the opportunity to work with other stakeholders to come up with something that was much more palatable to our water users and to the the to reclamation to stretch out our, op, our the applications of of the haze and nitrous oxide reductions, and we we think we've got a better plan to to do that EPA seems to agree we're getting credits for some of the work we're doing elsewhere in, in reclamation for some of the nitrous oxide uh, emissions at at NGS uh, that were identified in their BART proposal so I think we've we've made a lot of progress uh, with our partners and with the EPA to have a a, a more um, useful uh, approach to, to EPA's rule well, let me ask you a question since you brought that up. I mean, uh, did Congress ever pass uh, a carbon tax footprint? Uh, no, they didn't. I don't know. The answer is no. Okay. And to see the, um, the executive branch and the interior pushing this forward is actually uh, egregious, absolutely egregious. And so, um, you know, from that standpoint, um, it's been very clear that we're not going to have an alternative to, to NGS. And there, without that, we've got a problem. And the fact that we've had the federal government overstep Arizona's primacy issue on NGS is just outrageous, Out, absolutely outrageous. That con contract was actually outrageous. I mean, it's pretty much like putting a loaded gun in front of uh, CAP's uh, and NGS's head. So I, I will tell you, we're, there's very f a lot of people that are very upset. Uh, Mr. Primley, I'm troubled that the Bureau of Reclamation has spent $1.5 million on toilet exchange grants from the years 2005 to 2011. 2011. At this rate, we might be well flushing taxpayers' dollars down these upgraded toilets, literally. How much does the Bureau plan to spend on toilet exchanges in the fiscal year 2015? Well, our Water Smart program is at $52 million uh, for this year. <clears throat> I don't know how much of that goes to the, to the low flow toilet issue, but uh, it, has, it has produced wet water, the Water Smart program. The 840,000 acre foot uh, uh, target is is real water, drought proof water. So from that standpoint, it, it has been a very cost effective program. Okay, you know I got one real quick question. You know um, we've seen a number of people like the Bonneville customers have paid an average of an estimated 800 million per year in indirect and direct costs to comply with the endangered species. Do you believe that customers have the right to know on their energy bill of the related costs incurred by the result of environmental regulations? Mr. Gabriel, first. 
Um, I, I don't have an answer to that, sir. Why wouldn't you? In true transparency, we ought to be sharing what the taxpayer is actually paying for, don't you think? Uh, yeah. We do, we do not uh, measure or manage the, the those costs of environmental regulation. Uh, but that's a problem right well, now. Uh, gentlemen's time's expired. But I now recognize Mr. Gosar for his. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gabriel, I have received reports and comments from several Arizona electric cooperatives about the manner in which Western has excluded its customers from providing input into Western's decision-making process. I'm troubled to learn of Western's abandonment of historical, informal, explanatory protocol and Western's willingness to pursue and implement initiatives without substantial customer involvement. As you may recall, the House Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee included language in its FY 2014 Appropriations Bill admonishing Western for some of their questionable managerial tactics. The report language stated, the committee is concerned that the Western Area Power Administration has not been fully responsive in its efforts to work with its customers in implementing its Access to Capital A2C initiative. The committee believes that Western has relied too much on a top-down approach and could be missing innovative proposals from its customer base. Accordingly, accordingly, the committee hopes to see improvements in the approach Western takes and will continue to monitor further developments to ensure that customers' concerns are addressed. Now, I will continue to be a strong advocate of unobtrusive yet diligent congressional oversight of Western's operations and management to ensure their compliance with congressional intent and adherence to their original mission. So, Mr. Gabriel, can you briefly address some of my concerns and describe any specific efforts that Western has undertaken to fulfill its responsibilities to its customers and to incorporate their insights into Western policies and initiatives? Please cite specific examples where customer input was utilized in developing a final rule or policy. Uh, certainly. Uh, since my arrival 11 months ago, one of the things where, that I have prided myself on, as well as the rest of the organization, is meeting regularly and frequently with customers. This uh, had to do with everything from access to capital to the strategic roadmap, which was uh, broadly endorsed by customers. December 6, specifically, we had a meeting with all of the, uh, the Western preference customers uh, concerning the access to capital question. That was the development of the 10-year plans. Each one of the regions has had meetings with the customers, including the Desert Southwest, and they developed the 10-year financial forward picture for Western for that region, which was ultimately rolled up into the Western plan. And in fact, on the strategic roadmap, which I'd be happy to get you a copy of, uh, we took specific comments from customers, including the Desert Southwest, in fact, especially the Desert Southwest, uh, that changed and modified the way we were looking at that roadmap and the 10-year and the vision that we had. Uh, we have had uh, significant outreach to customers. I've attended at least half a dozen meetings myself. And in fact, um, uh, I think the letter that, uh, that uh, was, has been entered into the uh, testimony is a testament to that. That was actually generated by uh, folks in the desert southwest. So I believe we are uh, more than fulfilling our responsibility to engage stakeholders, preference customers, and uh, the changes are, are fairly obvious from our perspective, looking at our state of the assets report, our strategic roadmap, and our uh, uh, commitment to uh, financial openness and uh, transparency. Gotcha. Well, I'm going to continue with that line of questioning. Western must explore aggressive partnerships with customers to help improve construction, minimum cost of operations, and stabilize rates. What efforts has Western undertaken to utilize and expand its partnership relationships with customers, and how has this led to operational efficiencies and stabilization of rates? Please cite specific examples. Uh, specific examples are in uh, a number of our substations that have been upgraded with participation of the customers. Uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, several activities going on right now. Uh, we're looking at activities in the Gila substation and several others. I can get you certainly a, a broader list of that. Uh, at the Ship Rock, where we've had to have phase shifters added, that was done in partnership with the customers. And in fact, through that partnership, we took an original estimate of $20 million for the phase shifters, did some negotiations, working with the customers, working with the vendor, and got that down to $12.5 million. That lowered the cost. In fact, working with the Arizona Power Authority and several other customers in Arizona, we were able to uh, help effect a, a refinancing of the visitor center at Hoover Dam that's going to save customers a significant amount of money. Uh, in addition, in our Colorado River uh, storage project, uh, 
part through some negotiations. We've managed to save customers enough money so that the crisp customers, as we call them, will have an additional two years of rate stability, which means seven years where they will have not have had a rate increase. So we're partnering uh, very directly uh, all the time with our customers. I got one more question. Um, why did Western not conduct a public information forum or a public comment forum in the current Parker Date and Davis uh, Parker Davis rate proceeding? Um, by, by not following the historical and customary process, several of Western's customers were not aware that he had taken away their right of contract, contract cancellation upon a rate increase. When, where, and how did Western conduct an open uh, public hearing with his customers telling him uh, that you were planning to take this away from them? Well, again, I, 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 there's a matter of uh, interpretation as whether we took things away from them or not. Uh, our rate increases were not based on any fundamental rate change, which is when we have to go back to the customers. We certainly engage with them discussing the issues. Um, there but you chose not to have a public comment in, in Parker? Uh, not on that particular case. Why not? I mean, good stewardship, good customer service, just, you know, I mean, in, it's a pretty de deprived economically, uh, you know, area. Why wouldn't it be? Uh, I can't answer that question for you. Yeah, would you give me back that answer? I will, certainly. Um, for the record, I'd like to submit two letters um, from the Navajo Electric Cooperative and Arizona's G&T Cooperatives. For the record, please, I'd like to be those included. Thank you. I yield back.